Hey, welcome back to this mini lecture. My name is Dino. It's on uh, the iconic John Perry Barlow. It's on his declaration of the independence of cyberspace. That's Barlow, as you might imagine. Uh, the focus of this video is the declaration's impact on the internet today. So it was once written, uh, I believe it was 81. It was presented at Davos and it was, uh, you know, I had a particular tone to it, uh, and, and I wonder what its impact is on the on the internet today, and like uh, and like in terms of how you compare it to its ideals to what the realities are today. My first question for you: What are your initial thoughts on the Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace by John Perry Barlow? Do you like it? Do you dislike it? Why? Um, what parts resonate with you? Which ones do not? And I'm going to read out, I, I do this a lot I got when I'm looking at an article or some piece of text or something else, is to take out snippets of it, ones that I think are important. And I want to pose the following question. Are the following statements from the Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace, do you think they're true, fully true, fully false, or somewhere between truth and falsehood? And that, what I would say, is regarding the state of the internet today. So do you think what Barlow was stating back in, in the day uh, hold true today? Let's begin. All may enter. Here's a quote by Barlow, like all of them. Uh, we are creating a world of the internet that all may enter without privilege or prejudice accorded by race, economic power, military force, or station of birth. Do you think that's true? Do you think that's false or somewhere in between? Here is a list of countries, uh, the, popu the populations, a couple years ago. I, I, I underlined the, the bottom three. And uh, the, you know, let's say the United States, it obviously is a little bit bigger for that for all of North America. And let's say India and China is, you know, we're, um, together the two most populous nations. So basically, we put it together, it's like, um, the U.S. a little bit more than th uh, 330 million, and uh, China and India together is a bit uh, around 1. Point, uh, sorry, 2.85 billion people. So it's about let's just let's just sort of say it's about it's say, let's round it up to three billion. But it's basically about ten times the size, nine ten times the size. So you think if uh, um, the numbers would hold out for that's the populations that's uh, the pop the the raw population. You think that would hold up the same? In the uh, with the internet, if they were all equal, here you see 2021 is the share of global internet users by region. If you see on the left, North America, Central America, and Caribbean and Africa. Put that all together, it's around 10 percent of the, of the of the internet users. However, if you go to Central Asia, Western Asia, Southern Asia, Eastern Asia, Southeastern Asia, you put that all together, it's about four and a half, uh, 22 and a half, 26 and a half. Um, it's around 22, 40, it's about 45, I think it is, and I did my rough estimate, um, 45, 46. So it's roughly about five times the amount in the Asia's uh, together to, let's just say, represent uh, India and China. So it's really about four and a half to five times as many. So it's obvious that, that there's not as much representation of global internet users in China and India than there is in, in North America. I mean, that's probably at least partly due to socioeconomic status. Uh, people are normally a little bit wealthier in, in North and definitely North America. Uh, another quote, anywhere, anyone anywhere may express beliefs. This is Barlow's quote. We're creating a world online where anyone anywhere may express his or her beliefs, no matter how singular, without fear of being coerced into silence or conformity. Do you think that's true today? Is it false or is it somewhere in between? According to this gentleman, Joe Rogan, he's complained multiple times on his podcast. Someone who's very big in the in the online space for free speech through his podcast. Other big media stars have talked about how there's been silence. So, and then a number of people uh, across the political spectrum have, have stated that. So they believe that when they're what uh, if they have specific beliefs that are articulated in, in certain manners that they are not. They are cancelled is one word that's often being uh, used, and they uh, they express fears of being coerced into silence or conformity. So, whether you agree with those people or not, there is some pushback about this complete free expression by some big name um, uh, celebrities, personalities like Joe Rogan, etc. 
concepts of property, expression, identity, movement, and context do not apply. Here's a full quote. Your legal concepts of property, expression, identity, movement, and context do not apply to us. They are all based on matter, and there is no matter here. So do you think that these legal concepts do not apply to the internet? Do you think that's true, false, or somewhere in between? I would say just by purely the existence of Creative Commons, which is a really great site, it provides uh, people, uh, you decide, up, uh, you, you get some content that's uh, Creative uh, Commons licensed, you abide by the license, and then if you do that, you can use all that content for you know repurposing, remixing, etc., like, uh, depending on the license. That's fantastic. However, that's a relatively small percentage of the global output that's online. As a result, this Creative Commons, which allows uh, a, a, a more formal legal prop, uh, concepts of property, like uh, copy, like, like more formal copyright, which prevents people from using content, it kind of liberal, uh, liberalizes it and opens up to some extent. So it's a little bit easier to use stuff, and uh, various you know video, audio, images, etc. However, its its existence and the fact that it has a lot of co content, but a really relatively small percentage of what's online. It shows that concepts, that the legal concepts of property, expression, identity, movement, and context do in fact apply in many cases online. Or at least that's what I'm arguing here. Our own social contract. They get this from Barlow. We are forming our own social contract. This governance will arise according to the conditions of our world, not yours. Our world is different. Do you agree, disagree? Somewhere in between. Is it true, false? Again, or somewhere in between. Maybe let's first go to what is a social contract? That's the frontispiece of uh, um, Thomas Hobbes' iconic Leviathan, where this con this concept is mentioned. Again, what is a social contract? It's a voluntary agreement among, among individuals by which organized society is brought into being and invested with the right to secure mutual protection and welfare or to regulate the relations among its members. So it's like you voluntarily agree to the social contract to get certain rights, mutual protections, welfare, uh, and regulation of various things, like speech, for example, and other things. It's it's mentioned in Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan, as per the frontispiece in the last uh, slide, or last part of the video. Uh, John Locke's Second Treatise of Government and John Jacques Rousseau's Classic of the Social Contract. So that's what it basically is. However, as you see at the bottom, is there an internet social contract as like that adheres to this, like this, this uh, definition above, do you think so? Uh, if so, who created it? Was it created by regular global users? I'd say that there's any really formal internet social contract that's actually articulated or like written down is most likely in um, the EULAs, end user license agreements, where when you're using a platform or a service, it'll be like, hey, you can use our service, it's great, but you gotta buy by this, usually many pages of text in terms of their regulations, what they want you to have to be a, a legitimate user. So as a result, it leaves, seems at least there's a strong corporate influence in terms of what's online. So it's like the social contract that you're often adhering to, again, to use an app or a website, et cetera, an online service, is often dictated by a multinational corporation. So it's, if there is a social contract, it's often negotiated one-on-one -on -one depending on the site you use. It's often very similar, you know, like I'm sure the social contracts for, you know, Facebook, Twitter, blah, 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 and similar to social media websites, for example, are somewhat similar. They're obviously going to be different because the content is different and the, and the users are different, but they're somewhat, you know, they have a lot of similarities. And as a result, it's not just the regular Joe Blows like myself or yourself who's making these contracts, the social contract online. It seems more it's like a, um, a big uh, multinational corporation and more likely the lawyers who work for that uh, large uh, corporation. From this overall, what are some takeaways and some questions? Takeaways on the internet's independence today based on those ideals of uh, Barlow. Uh, here's some quotes. All may enter without a privilege or a prejudice, or perhaps all may not enter without privilege or prejudice, just by looking at the internet region, um, a percentage of users, comparing just the United States or North America to the various parts of Asia, it seems if you have, um, if you're socioeconomically wealthy, you have much more access. Like I, I often use a, now a one gigabyte internet service, and the reason I have that is I, I can afford it, or at least I choose to spend money on that. Not everyone has that privilege, even. So not even just getting access, but getting the best access possible. And the quote: "Anyone anywhere may express his or her beliefs." 
perhaps may not. And uh, that's, again, shown by many, many online personalities, the Joe Rogans of the world, other ones who are in the public spotlight who have expressed that they've been quote-unquote canceled, which it can be funny when you're making hundreds of millions of dollars from Spotify, etc., saying they're being canceled. Seems maybe not the most... Uh, um, agreeable, uh, like it's not, it's not maybe exactly what's happening if you have, you know, uh, 10, 11 million, 10 or 11 million listeners every week. Um, although um, Spotify, where Rogan's currently hosted, I guess could say something to him formally. Uh, legal concepts of property, expression, identity, movement, and contract do not apply here. Perhaps they do. It seems like, again, just purely from the existence of, of, of Creative Commons which is a fantastic site which somewhat liberalizes property um, rights online and allows people to use uh, content more freely like video, audio, images, etc. Um, just the fact that it's there, it's saying, hey, yeah, people should be able to use this, this content somewhat freely begs the question that maybe the reason that there's a push for Creative Commons is the fact that these uh, concepts of property, etc. do apply. And finally, governance, uh, governance will arise according to the conditions of our world. Or, and, and, and when I say our world, I mean just we regular users, or, or is it in fact instead uh, our, our, the conditions that govern the internet are largely dictated by the companies that run these platforms and internet service providers and governments that regulate them when, when, when they have the um, capability. If you, if, if, you sort of, if any of this resonates with you, my final question would be this. If you think that the the highfalutin inspirational language that Barlow articulated at Davos, and I think it was again, again 1981 in his uh, Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace, do you, if you think when you read the full text that you like what it says, like but it being a fully place without privilege, without prejudice, you express your ideas, you, no concepts of property, and and we're governing the con uh, conditions, we just regular users. If you believe that and you, uh, was the case of Barlow and you believe that inspirational message, and if you believe that's not the case today, how do you re reinvigorate uh, Barlow's original ideas or ideals for these cyber, for cyberspace, the internet, et cetera, et cetera? That was a discussion of uh, a declaration of this independence of cyberspace by John Perry Barlow. My name is Dino. Thanks for watching. Please feel free to like this video. Please feel free to comment. Um, have you read a declaration of the independence of cyberspace? If so, do you like it? Do you dislike it? Are parts that you really, really like? Please share those. Are parts that you don't like? And finally, do you think if you think it's maybe somewhat compromised this inspirational vision, how do we reinvigorate it? Uh, finally, please feel free to subscribe to this channel if you like this type of content. As always, I'm Dino. Thanks for watching. Take care. Have a great night or day.